how many of you recognize and realize that we must be tithers and givers in order to invoke the blessing in our lives? It, the blessing doesn't happen automatic. Now, let me share something with you. You could be doing good at what you are doing and never tithe and give, but that don't mean you are blessed. That means you're just a hard worker, and we need to know the difference. See, God got a way of prospering us without us toiling, and that's what you want. Because if you got to wrestle, and you're still wrestling whether or not I'm going to have a job tomorrow, you're toiling. Mm. Because in our society today, we don't know where your job might be tomorrow. Not your concern. Jesus said to cast all your care on me, for I care for who? You. Which means you're not supposed to worry about your job and how you're going to live, where you're going to stay, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, what you're going to drive. Those are not your concerns. And we are illegal. We're doing an illegal action when we do take them on. And then we open the door for sickness and disease because we're taking on a problem that is not ours. Ooh, Jesus. You're not supposed to worry about money. I don't care what you got going in your house. You're not supposed to worry about money. How can you trust God to get you out when you're worrying about money. They do not dwell together. One counsels out the other. So this morning, if you're worrying about money, you need to leave it alone and throw it over on God. You need to see yourself, visualize yourself, putting all that stuff in a basket and then just tossing the whole basket over on Jesus. Just tell him, hey, take it all. And then you don't go back and try to retrieve any of it. When you give something to somebody, you don't try to monitor how they use it. So it's not your business what God does with it. <laughs> All you know is not yours anymore. So quit trying to monitor how God handling your business. He's smarter than you, trust him. I'm telling you, that's how I live day to day, because I trust him. I was sharing with my daughter. She said, we were just having a general conversation. She was asking me some questions. I told her, I said, look, with the responsibility I have, I had to learn how to trust God. Even before your daddy passed, I had to trust God, because sometimes it didn't look like, say it didn't look like, money was present. But we never, ever went without somewhere to stay, Something to dry, something to eat, something to wear. When the heat went out, God provided. He took it. It was his house. <laughs> That's his care, not mine. <laughs> You're going to learn this one day because it's going to take the stress off your body. Your body is under undue stress because you're worrying about money. And then you bring that stress into every relationship you have. When money is never an issue with God, it's whether or not you trust him. Because he can get you out. Look at your neighbor and say, he can get you out. Because he knows the way. So he can get you out. He knows where all the money is. He knows where they've been stealing from you and know how to get it back to you. I had a company to send me a check, and I'm going like, I had forgot, I didn't know the company still existed. But God knew they had stole from me. And I'm a tither and a giver. Some of y'all got money that's been stolen from you, and until you learn how to trust God with your money, you can't never get that back. The enemy stole it. And the Bible declares that when you discover this thief stole from you, he's required to give it back to you sevenfold. 
I mean, he can't give you back just what he stole. He got to pay reparate, what is it called? What is it called? He got to pay you some and some extra. So you need to stop letting them slip through the crack. Keep tithing and giving. Keep trusting God. Don't go back and say, well, I wonder if this such and such happened in it. You know, I was dealing with my insurance company recently. And where they had, you need to look at this because I, you know, this is why you need to read the stuff when it comes in the mail. They had attached a policy to my house as though I didn't have flood insurance. I've always had flood insurance. Never lapsed. Said never lapsed. So how dare they charge me an additional $1,200 for one year in flood insurance? It doesn't even cost that much. The lady said, well, if you fax me, I said, you go back in your book and you look. This, now, if you didn't get the information from the flood insurance, that is not my fault. They sent the paperwork to you all. Y'all might not have looked at it. Oh, man, I started, I started talking. Now I could feel it come going like she trying to keep my money. I said, you ain't stealing from me. She said, well, if you can send it over, and you know what I did? I got right up and faxed my declaration sheet over to her. Guess what? Money coming to me where now. <laughs> Give me my money back. You charged me for it in 21. Illegally. The devil's a thief. And if you let him get away with it, he got it. And if you don't read your statement month to month, you homeowners, all you do is write it out and make the payment. You don't know when they're stealing from you. See, that God had the alert, because see, when I was looking at it, I hadn't paid it in a man. And God said, look at the statement again. When I saw that, I said, what the what? <laughs> so I'm telling you, God knows how to take care of you. Are you ready to tithe and give? Yeah. He's, all, he's much better at this than we are. And we need to trust him in every area of our lives, but especially in finances. Glory to God. Now, Father God, we are so grateful for this great covenant called tithing and giving. Now, Jesus, you are the high priest over the tithe and the offering. Therefore, we have brought out the whole tithe. We have not demoted the tithes in our hearts. Neither have we transgressed against the tithe. We didn't take the tithe and spend it on something else. But we sanctified the tithe and set it aside for your use only. Now we are also presenting to you the offering that you put in our hearts. That amount that you gave us to sow. And we didn't take one penny from it. We didn't withhold not one penny from the offering that you put in our hearts. So cheerfully, joyfully, and hilariously, we are sowing our seed because we know that you are the Lord of the harvest. You are the one that calls increase. So with great boldness, we decree and we declare that money coming to us and money is loosed upon us for the cause of this great and wonderful gospel. Hallelujah. Are you ready? Let's tithe and give because we got supernatural expectation. If you would like to support Rapture Ministries financially, you can do so online. Go to raptureministries.org and click the Give button. There you can give securely through PayPal. If you're one of our local members, be sure to include your CID number and your giving breakdown. We thank you for every gift. You help make all of this possible. Thank you. Hallelujah. Now, Father, since we are committed sowers and we are committed reapers because we saw in your word the harvesting is our responsibility. So by our spoken words of faith, that's how we reap. We, we reap with our words. We send forth the word and cause the word to bring in the harvest. So we will reap our full harvest from the seed we have sown. The harvest... We are talking to you. We command you to come to us now because we refuse to back off or get discouraged. We will stay strong in faith. We expect to receive our hundredfold return harvest. Now, Satan, you cannot participate. You've already been bound against this harvest, and we release the harvest into our hands now. 
and we believe that we receive it. Now, angels, you go get it and bring it to us because we need it for the kingdom's sake. And God knows that we need it to help this society that we are living in. We need resources. So angels, bring it to us as we obey the word that we receive because we're not just good givers, but we are good reapers. Can you say I'm a reaper? Hallelujah. You may be seated in his presence. Hallelujah. 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 Well, we're going to continue our lesson in marriage. But we got to talk about this morning about the priority of singleness. Say singleness. Now, I just want to go back and uh, let me just make this statement first of all. Pastor DJ and myself are trying to convey to you the absolute importance of having the God kind of marriage or God kind of relationship. You may not desire to be married, and that's okay. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that if you don't want to be married. It's okay. But you need some other things in your life if they are not present. And we're going to help you with some of those if the Lord say the same today. Amen? Amen. But just recapping a little bit from last Sunday, how many of you learned something last Sunday? We learned that putting conditions in a relationship is what destroys the relationship. Because when you love like God, you love him unconditionally. Now, does that mean you go into a marriage and the person shouldn't do right by you? That's not what I'm saying. So let's not take things out of context, okay? But what I am saying, you go in there, you don't expect them to make you happy. Because that's not their job. Your spouse not to make you happy. They're supposed to please you, but happy is a whole different word. We put a responsibility on our spouses to make us something we are not willing to become. And it creates friction in the marriage. Okay, now I'm going into my lesson because I see you right now. Put your hands on your head. <laughs> and say, so... Receive this, word. Receive this word. Now, today I'll be teaching on singleness. What we have been taught about singleness as a rule has been totally incorrect. Now, you need to write that down so you can, your brain can process it. What you understand about singleness as a rule is totally incorrect. So Pastor DJ and myself, along with the help of the Holy Spirit, our endeavorment is to rewrite and remove erroneous information. Now you do what you want to do with it once we get it into the atmosphere. It's up to you to believe or not to believe it. And however your life turns out is your choice. We have handled singleness as though it is a disease and we need to get rid of it. We made single people feel like they come into crime because they're not married. Where most married people want to be single. <laughs> or unmarried, because the word, see, we use the word single for the word unmarried, and they are not the same. They are not the same. Here's some facts you might want to write down before we get started. Being unmarried does not make you single. Singleness is the most important state of human development. I'll go back home because I know some people write. Singleness is God's prerequisite or his foundation for marriage. Ooh, Jesus. This is going to help a lot of y'all. It is the first building block of human society, not marriage. God began the human race with a single, not a couple. All right, you got that down? So we, we, we are learning this morning that a marriage is only as good as your singleness. Whatever you are is what you're going to bring into the marriage. So if you're not fixing you now while you are single, you're going to be broke when you go into the marriage. And what you're looking for is for marriage to fix your brokenness 
and it can't. We have been taught that marriage is the foundation of our society. The problem with this is that the Bible doesn't teach this. Turn to Genesis 1.28. Do you need to put your hand on your head again? Genesis 1. Let's start with verse 126. That was my husband's favorite scripture, Genesis 126. Uh, and the other one was Romans 12, 1 and 2. Genesis 1, 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the couch and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Was the physical man on the earth yet? No. What was God doing? He is speaking who man shall be and what man shall have and what man can do. Look at verse 27. So God created man. What is man? Man is not physical. Man is spirit. You need to rewrite that. Man is not physical. He is spirit. God created man in his own image because God is a spirit. And if we are created in his image, you are spirit. And you are more spirit than you are flesh. Oh, Jesus. In the image of God created he, him, male, and what? Female created he them. Now, here's a principle you need to know about God in order to understand Genesis. God always goes to the end, finishes it, and then back up and start from start. If you don't understand that. So what God has done in verse 27, he has finished all mankind. And he put all mankind in one man. The whole human race was put in Adam. Single. Adam. But inside of Adam was another male who we, later we discover became the woman, the, a male with a womb or one man. Amen? Now, we won't get into all that. We'll we say that for another lesson. But we, I'm trying to show you this point. That unless you understand that God always sees the end from the beginning, you're not going to understand what we're going to talk about today because we have been bombarded with incorrect information about singleness. So the Bible doesn't teach that marriage is the foundation of our society. That's erroneous. This is why so many marriages fail. Because we think marriage is the problem solver. But you can't take into marriage but who you are. Mm. The Bible teaches that the foundation of family is a single person. Put your hands on your head again. Because you're going to struggle a moment or two. And say, so receive this word. See, marriage is the second phase. Not the first. Come on, say marriage, marriage is the second phase, not the first. Do you realize that all the instructions God gave to man was when he when man was in his single state? Eve was not physically on the earth, apart from being inside of Adam. She was present, but not present. She couldn't, he couldn't see her. And guess what? God never told Eve about the tree. God never told Eve to go to work. God never told Eve to cultivate. And he did not tell Eve to protect Eden. He told that to the single man. So what was he doing? 
He was telling his man, you need to do something because I got something good coming your way. But you cannot receive her in your present condition. You must know how to handle what I'm getting ready to give you. Because God had already finished the work. So he knew woman was coming. But man had to be prepped for her. You single women, don't you, don't you marry a man because you feel like you're desperate. You're not getting that, you're not that old. I mean, 70 year old women still getting married. What's wrong with you? You're like 30 years old, or 40 years old, or 60 years old. What's wrong with y'all? 60 is the new 30. Didn't you know that? Didn't I tell you that? <laughs> and if you be y'all 60, you ought to say, hey, hallelujah. <laughs> You're the new 30. So God never told Eve to do those things. And when you put requirements on a woman to do them, she break down. Listen to me. If you, if you are unmarried, don't marry somebody that's going to take your money and you got to split the responsibility half and half. Leave him back on the shelf. He ain't ready for you. You're too valuable to accept that arrangement because that's not marriage. That's an arrangement. We make an arrangement. You pay half the mortgage, or if I pay the mortgage, you pay all the utilities. That's an arrangement. That's not marriage. And anytime you can't uphold your part of the deal, we had issues. I didn't marry you to take care of you. I married you because we had two incomes. Oh, I know I'm teaching better than y'all shouting. And I was depending on your income, so I wouldn't have to give up my toys. That's the way it is with a lot of marriages. Ooh, Jesus. Mm. Being single is more important than being married. So what we have in our society now is not a singleness problem but a being single problem. How many of y'all heard that? Because I use that word being single because that's what most people think they are when they are not married. No, you just unmarried. Quit calling yourself single unless you understand what single is. Amen? Fact number five, never confuse being single with being alone. A lot of people get married because they're lonely. It's the biggest crime against the marriage institution is to marry somebody because you want company. All the hell will come with the person coming along with the company. What you going to do with that? Just because you like talking to them. So God's focus is not on marriage first, but singleness first. And in Genesis 1, 27, now let's look at verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, he's talking to who? What, where was the woman? She, she was still inside of Adam. But God talking to them, because she's inside of him. And when God spoke to him, he spoke to all mankind, including Eve. And God blessed them as God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion and have dominion. Exercise your dominion over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Notice here that God did not make husband and wife. He didn't say wives and husband do this together. God is very plain in the way he talks. So he didn't make a mistake and didn't put husband and wife there. They were not husband and wife. 
yet. He was talking to two single people. That he looked forward to them doing what? Being fruitful, multiplying. And they're talking about having the babies yet. See, y'all got that all messed up. I know growing up, we said multiply. Oh, child, just keep right on hand the babies for the Lord. And you couldn't afford the one you got. And you end up with 10 babies listening to that old teacher. And everybody's struggling. You can't keep shoes on the kids' feet. Thank God you didn't abort them, but it was not time for all them babies to come into the world like that. And you not prepared for them. Okay, that's another lesson. Keep right on moving. God is talking to singleness here. Remember this. God always creates the most important first, and then he creates in consecutive order. So whatever God places as a foundation of something, it is the foundation of it. Singleness was the foundation of human society, not marriage. I know I'm helping you this morning because the Lord is showing it to me. Yeah. So now let's define singleness. Singleness means separate or detached, different. You got to be different. When you're single, you don't just mesh with everything. You stand out. I like the song Ty Tribby wrote, stand out. Don't be conformed to this world, but stand out. You're not supposed to look like the world. You are different. Then singleness also means unique, original. Special, distinctive. There should be something special about you that will make the person that meet you so happy to be around you. You are special. You ever been around a person look like they'll never have a down day? And you like being in their presence because they make you feel good? And when they talk, they're always talking upbeat. See, it's something special. You need to find out what makes them be that way every single day. Something special. Something unique. And then the word singleness also means whole. W-H-O-L-E. Complete. Unified. One with self. Woo, to be one with yourself. This means... See, this is something I had to learn over the years because when I got married, I didn't have this teaching. But I thank God I was submitted. Are y'all hearing me? In a submitted state, you can learn what you didn't learn before you left home. But in your arrogance, you'll never learn these things. And you can be born again 50 years and never learn these things because it takes submission to learn them when you're in the marriage. You got to be willing to say, you know what? I don't know. It's as simple as that. I don't know. Teach me, Holy Spirit. This means in my wholeness, I love me. I understand and love my value. I realize I am valuable. I'm not just a piece of meat. I'm not somebody for some man to dog around and push around. I'm not for the woman to just feel like I'm supposed to give her everything she asked for, even if it's unrealistic. You're not a piece of meat. You are valuable. And you need to esteem yourself. Now, I didn't say get cocky. I said, but you need to esteem yourself high in the Lord. You're seated high above the earth. You're seated next to Jesus himself. We're in him, rather. We're seated in him. We are seated in him. And he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. How dare you think so little of yourself? 
It's because you don't understand singleness. That's why most people suffer with low self-esteem, because they don't understand their value. This means I don't need you to make me feel like somebody. You don't need no man or woman to make you feel important. Can't nobody else give you your self-value? You learn that in your prayer closet. He says, see, I am somebody all by myself. Come on, be bold. Come on, say it out your mouth. I am somebody all by myself. I don't need to be attached to a person to feel important. And I ain't got to bribe nobody to have fellowship. Because I understand I am really good all by myself. It took me some years to understand that, but I got it. Because that's where a lot of our defeat is. We're trying to have faith for something but we don't see ourselves worthy of it. You are worthy of the best marriage that you can ever have. And it's worth waiting for the right person. So listen to me. Marriage will not improve your singleness or your lack of it, but expose it. It's like a mirror. If you think that marriage will solve your loneliness, marriage will expose your loneliness. Woo, Jesus. Marriage doesn't fix those issues, ladies or men. All it does is create a bigger problem. It exposes your deficiencies. Who you really aren't. Marriage will expose those. And for the first time, reality hits the person that married you. They ain't that. I thought they were somebody else. But it's kind of too late. So we must learn the advantages of being single, but not alone. And we'll talk about that, if the Lord say the same, next week. Look at Genesis 2.15. And the Lord God took the man. Took the who? Took the who? No, he put husband and wife. No, he put a single man and put him into the God of Eden to do what? To dress it and to keep it. So in this verse, we see that God commands to work. He commands the man to work. The word work here means to become. Not just labor. The word work means to become. Adam, become what I call you. Develop it. I put in you, Adam, what I design you to be. Now become it. Work at it. Ooh, Jesus. Did y'all hear that? Work at becoming who I say you are. This word is not talking about laboring in a nine to five job. It's saying work on who God says you are. That's your primary job, is to find out who you are and work on it. And it should be done before marriage. Because the more you know about you, the greater marriage can be. Woo, Jesus. So work means, if Adam, you come, become who I see you as. And not what society have named you. Mm. Look at 
Look at Matthew, I think this is where I want to go. Matthew chapter, yeah, Matthew 19. Let's just start begin with verse 1. Go down to verse 6. Oh, Jesus. Let us just start reading in verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him. Who they tempting? They tempting Jesus. And they asking him this question. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Because, you know, I told you on last Sunday, they were divorcing the women. They, Moses started it. And people were, and man was manipulating that thing to his advantage. So he could marry 30 times in his lifetime depending on what infraction the woman committed. But look how Jesus answered. And he answered, said unto them, Have you not read the word? I'm just my inclusion. That he which made them at the beginning made them what? He made two single people. He made two single people. He's going to teach them a valuable lesson. He didn't make them husband and wife first. He made two single people. <laughs> and for this cause, what cause? Because we got two single people, understand the purpose, working at what God has called them to be. Not feeling the itch to be married. Because neither one of them was processing marriage in their mind. God had to tell Adam, it's not good to be all by yourself. It's not good to be so exclusive. You, you need somebody else like yourself. Did y'all hear what I just said? You need somebody like yourself. So why do we keep marrying people unlike us? They don't believe nothing we believe. They don't go the same places we want to go. Watch this. Verse 5, are you there? And Jesus said, for this cause, what cause? Two single people that are separate, unique, and whole. that are separate, unique, and whole. That's the kind of person you want to marry. Woo, Jesus. And for that cause shall a man leave father and mother. And if he ain't there, you need to leave him with father and mother. Because he ain't going to cleave to you. You won't be his priority, wife, because he don't know who he is yet. Oh, Jesus. Now, now, see, we don't need spirit involved just right now because they already have the spirit of God living in them. They got God. And he says, now we're going to create this oneness between the flesh. Now we got marriage. Adam got somebody just like himself. And if the blind lead the blind, they both do what? Fall in the ditch, and their children follow after them. Ignorance is not bliss. It is very destructive. He says in verse 6, Wherefore they are no more twain. We got marriage, but one flesh. What therefore God have joined together. Now y'all know some of these marriages God didn't join together. Let no man put asunder. Because we didn't enter into the union based on who God needed us to be. This is why you got to present. If you were married before you got born again, you need to present your marriage back unto the Lord. And let him start it all over again. So it can be right. You can't get this on that old stuff. You cannot put new wine in old skin. Why we keep trying it? 
You're trying to maintain all that old trash you learned before you got born again. And it does not work with the kingdom of God. Y'all getting them cues. Oh, if I get this little cute nightgown, I'm going to rise it. That lasts for the five minutes that you got it on. And what goes beyond that? The bill's still present. Y'all still got issues. So the sex didn't solve it. Oh, you felt good, but it didn't solve your issues. Now, in the marriage, you can become single. You should become single. It'll improve your marriage. And you can become so valuable to your spouse, they can't imagine being without you. Do you know that's what Jesus did? Jesus can't imagine being without the church because he's married to the church. Woo, Jesus. Did y'all ever read Ephesians when he talk about, he says, this, he said, he said, say, even though I'm talking about, this is, I'm talking about the church. When he was talking about marriage. Because that's his bride. So he's already prepped everything. The bride don't want nothing. If you tap into God right, you don't want for nothing. What you need, sugar? Mm, I got it. What, what you talk? Oh, it's already here. Remember we talked about what Karen is? Karen is a what? Anticipation of a need and meet it before you need it. You don't wait till it's time to sit at the table and eat dinner and then say, I got to go to the store. You have a lot of angry people in your house. Trust me, they are not going to like you at that moment. So Jesus just told us the reason that two people should get married. When you have two people who are separate, unique, and whole. So then the point is not to look for someone else first, but to become who God sees you as first. And what this will do, this will stop you from accepting crumbs. You won't settle when you know more about who God made you. <laughs> You'll stop settling. If you, I got some questions. See, nothing is worse than marrying someone who has not established their singleness. Why? Because now one of you have to become a babysitter, a parent, a victim of their immaturity, they can become a parasite, a leech. In other words, they become a deficit. And when the weight is unevenly distributed, the one carrying the most weight will grow weary of the relationship. Did I hit that on the nail? Oh, yes, I did. Thank you, Holy Ghost. So marriage will expose your deficiency. If you already know you got deficiencies, don't wait till you get married to try to fix them. Fix them now. That's stupid. To marry somebody and you know you can't cook. Go to school for cooking. Go to YouTube. They got everything you need up there. Even if they can't cook, learn something. How to boil water. How to set the table. You Google everything but what you need. You're always on Facebook listening to somebody else's gossip and trash. Go there and find out how to look at furniture. What's good and what's not bad. What's bad? Learn the different styles of furniture. You need to educate yourself. You talking about being a wife and you don't even know the styles of furniture. Oh, I know I'm talking to y'all. And you see that little cheap stuff in the store, you think it's all that because it's on sale. I was willing to wait on furniture because I wanted something that lasted. I didn't plan on my husband buying furniture 15 times in 15 years. When you got children, you can't buy what 
I might have in my front room and put it in your family room. It ain't going to work. Your kid's going to tear it up. By the time they get through eating on it, slobbing on it, pooting on it. <laughs> you trying to put living room furniture in a family room. See, you don't even know. <laughs> you need to educate yourself. And man, just because you got money, you shouldn't be spending money on stuff you can learn to do. Learn how to put the gas in the car. Come on. <laughs> Learn how to find, I mean, we don't tune cars anymore because they're so electronically done. But still, the things that you know how to do or can learn to do, do them. All to do is bring your value up and your wife will come out and say, oh, baby, I didn't know you know how to do that. You're so smart. <laughs> Man, your real estate just went up. But you would have never known that if you hadn't taken time to learn it. See, this is all part of your singleness. So when you get married, you got something to bring into the marriage instead of a book of deficiencies. Why? Because two halves don't make a whole. That's in math, not in marriage. A nobody marrying a nobody ain't nobody home. <laughs> Listen, the only way to become yourself, I'm getting ready to close in just a minute, is to discover yourself. You must allow the Spirit of God to reveal you to you. So when you go in prayer, quit asking the Lord to change your man. Ask him to change you. Show me me. How do I do that, Pastor Diana? I'm so glad you asked me that. Number one, you go to the Word and learn your identity in Christ. Stop identifying with the flesh. Ooh, all of our identity is connected to our natural and physical birth, and you shouldn't stay there. It's okay. I know your dad and your mom, they brought you. I'm not, we're not talking about that. That's not your real identity. They were the transporters that got you here. But your identity is in Christ. And if you don't know who Christ made you yet, you're not ready for marriage. See, when you struggle with your identity, you always want to look like someone else. Remember the saying, like Mike, or like Nike, like whoever it was. Is that Mike? Oh, I got it right. Oh, Lord, I got it right. Mm. My children are going to give me a high five for getting it right. See, you always, you always want to look like someone else because you don't know who you are. Your dress style, your hairstyle, the type of car you drive, these things are based on someone else's identity. If you never had a picture of them and didn't see certain things on TV or on someone else, would you choose that for you? That's that uniqueness. I got my own style. And my husband helped shape my style. Could that please him? And now it pleases me. I don't have to get a new style to please you. I'm so unique that when I wear it, you can buy it and wear it and never look like me. Because I'm unique. <laughs> Am I helping anybody this morning? Do you know that all of the fashion world is built on our lack of identity? So to fit in, we look like them. You still don't know if that's the style you would wear if they didn't put it in the store. And they, they bombard you with it so you don't have many choices. But you do. You just got to dig a little bit deeper. It's out there. Your style 
is out there. But do you know your style? Number two, where am I from? That's your source. Listen, you are not from the city and state you physically live in. Now, if you try to find where you are from by using your ethnic heritage, you're going to get lost. You know why you're going to get lost? Because all families on the earth are related. It's just a ball of confusion. All of us are related. <laughs> oh, Jesus. If all of us came out of Adam, <laughs> where do you think you came from? <laughs> huh? All of us are related. So if you're trying to trace your heritage, it's going to go right back to Adam. It's your spiritual heritage that you know so little about. You need to know that you came from the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. You're part of a whole brand new kingdom now. And you need to learn that kingdom. Because the rules and the, the things that you do and don't do are totally different from the world you came out of. Colossians 1, 13. Who have delivered us from the power of darkness. Who delivered us? Jesus did. He took us out of the grips of the devil and have put us into or translated us or put us into the kingdom of his dear son. God did that by choice because he loved you. Unconditional love. Why? Because God is single. God can't afford it because he ain't got no hangups. That's why when man violated, God didn't have a spasm. I made the man, and this all you can give me back? No. He found a way to restore who he loved. Woo, Jesus. Ah, oh, Hallelujah. So you come from a totally different kingdom, and the rules of love is totally different. That love you learned in the world doesn't even stand a chance in the kingdom of God. Because it's all based on what? Eros. Feelings. What your eyes see and get pleasure from. Thirdly, why am I here? In other words, what you're asking What's my purpose for being born? Mm. This question, like all of these are, are answered in your fellowship with the Holy Spirit and the Word. You must be in pursuit, say pursuit, of the answers to the first two to open the door of revelation to this question. Purpose will never be discovered until you know who I am and where I come from. And then you'll learn why you're here. Because assignment comes with your understanding who you are and where you're from. Hmm. But you must be in pursuit of the first two so the door of revelation can be open unto this question. It gets answered as you seek to know who you are. Hmm. Number four, what can I do? This represents your potential. The world does not have a mechanism to measure how much you know. Some of you right here or looking online have shut down your potential based on a test or an exam you failed in high school. And you let that tell you how much you know. Wrong. Ooh, I know, I know, I mean, I'm, I'm really getting it, Lord. You, you're doing good, Lord. You're doing real good. A test is not the sum total of what you can do. Only God knows your full potential because he put it in you. 
And since he put it in you, don't let a test tell you that's all you can do. Don't let them redefine your potential. Work at what? Being who God sees you as. And you'll discover your potential. A lot of people went to their grave never knowing all that God had put inside of them. Smart people, but never discovered who they were in Christ. Born again people, but never discovered what they can do. And fifth, the fifth one is, where am I going? This speaks to your destiny. This speaks to how you will end up and not just where you end up. i say that again because you might want to write that down. Where am I going? This speaks to your destiny. This speaks to how you will end up and not just where you end up. Will I get all that God has given to me? That's how you end up. Am I pursuing what God has called me to be so I can have all that he gave me? Will I complete what God has assigned unto me? Each one of us have an assignment. And the assignment is the ministry of reconciliation. Let me, let me share this with you. Every one of us that say we're believers have been given the same ministry. That's the ministry of reconciliation. We are to reconcile through our lives the world back unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how God uses that ministry through you, you have to find out because he's going to judge you based on the how and the way he told you to do it. That's why you can't be a copycat. You must be single. Because the way God used you to do it may not be the way you see somebody else on TV doing it. May not even be the way I do it. But that assignment is important, and you need to find out how God wants you to do your part of this assignment. Because that's crucial. Because that's where you're going to be finally graded on. Not whether or not you passed a test or failed a test in the world, but whether or not you did the assignment that was assigned to you. Mm. Matthew 7, 21 reads, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. See, it's about getting the will done. It's about getting the will done. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So we have to go in there and let Jesus reveal by the Spirit of God who we are, what we can do, what we have. What's my purpose? Didn't you know that Apostle Paul knew how he was going to die? He knew that based on his purpose. You can't write as much of the New Testament as he wrote and don't know how you're going to end up. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. He stayed in the will of God. And even though he did not die, the kind of death you and I would want to die, but it was the plan of God for his life. And he accepted it. Out of all the apostles, John the beloved was the only one that died a natural death. Now they tried to kill him. They put him in boiling oil. You tried living through boiling oil. And you don't know this. The reason John could come out <laughs> smiling. <laughs> And they got so tired of trying to kill him, they put him on the island all to himself. And then he got out there, and the Lord showed him the book of Revelation. Still on the job. (laughs) 
Jesus said in John 5, 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. He said, my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. See, you got to be seeking the will of God for your life and not marriage. Marriage is not the priority. God will give you a good spouse when you're seeking him. In the Amplified, it reads like this. I am able to do nothing from myself independently of my own accord because only as I am taught by God and as I get his orders, even as I hear, I judge. I decide as I am bidden to decide. As the voice comes to me, so I give a decision. And my judgment is right and just because I do not seek or consult my own will. I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself. My own aim, my own purpose for only the will and pleasure of the Father who sent me. You've been sent from the kingdom of light into a dark world to represent your kingdom. And there's an assignment that goes with that that you must attend to. I don't care how busy you are. I don't care how many people you got around in your life. You must learn who God called you to be. Because that's what you answer for. Now, every person listening to me wants to be successful in life. But the reason most people don't succeed is because they don't know who they are. They don't really know who God has called them to be. Every believer has been given the ministry of reconciliation. I said again, now how you carry it out, only God knows that. Those specifics that you need to know how to do it, when to do it, that's in God for you. And you have to learn it from God. I can encourage you. God can even show me some things about you. But you got to know for you. So we must stop learning about ourselves from the flesh only and discover the real you, the spirit you. And become single. Did you learn anything this morning? Those looking online, the will of God for you still is in earth as it is in heaven. I want y'all to go back and hit that like, subscribe. Hit the subscribe three, four times if you need to. Get us out there because people need to hear these truths that we are learning. Tell somebody, everybody in this room, you need to go back and go to our channel on YouTube and hit subscribe. Send it to your homies. Send it to your friends. Send it to your enemies. Let them hear what God is showing you because it's so necessary so we can become all that God has called us to be. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Our greatest desire is that you be single, productive, separate, unique, and whole. Because that's who you are in Christ Jesus. God bless you. Have a great day. See you on Wednesday night.